Welcome to our uh, 2020 Combine Clinics. Uh, my name is Louis Melanson, uh, product specialist out of uh, Western Canada. And in the next 40 minutes or so, we're gonna run through this PowerPoint presentation over here. Basically, what we are trying to get accomplished here is to try to get your, uh, your combine optimized to where you get the peak performance out of your machine. We buy these combines, we all know, they're pretty expensive, and you need to be able to get these things to perform properly in the field. So through this whole presentation, this is basically a generic presentation, uh, we'll be talking about stuff that applies to a 250 series combines, to a 240 series, a 230 series combines, an 8010, 20 series, and some of the stuff also applies to the mid-range combines. Okay, so thrash and system are pretty much equal in all the combines that Case IH built way back to 1977. So pay attention because some of these things, a lot of these things are going to apply to pretty much all of the Case IH combines. All right, so let's jump into this. And again, some of the adjustments that we're gonna be talking about over here, we're talking about optimizing the combine. So they're not all necessary that you have to go in there and do all these adjustments. The adjustments we're going to be talking about is the ones that all of a sudden I go to the field, the crop may not be fit to harvest yet, but I need to get the crops off. So doing these adjustments will get a little bit better performance out of your combine in hard thrash conditions. All right, next thing. There is a site that you can go to to get some videos on the 240 series combines. I know this is a long link, but if you take a picture of this and go in there and enter it, it'll take you to a YouTube site, and on there you will have different portions of the combines. So you can pick the ones that interest you the most. For example, I just threw one on here. Pivoting spout operation on flagship combines. This will take you into how to adjust the pivoting spout to get the maximum performance out of it. And what do I mean by that? Okay, so if you have a electrically adjusted pivoting spout at the end of the unloading auger, that spout can actually be adjusted to a different position. So if it's windy today, I may want to set it to where when I engage the unloading auger, the pivoting spout is going to come and I can set it to where it's straight down. For example, I'm doing canola. We all know canola is a light crop. I need the wind to not blow my kernels off of the truck. So I would set it straight down. I go to wheat, then I'm gonna put it at 70%, for example, and then it'll shoot a little further out so I don't need to bring my combine as close to the grain cart or the semi or whatever I'm unloading into. Okay, and that's all adjustable. You tell it where you want it to go. And then you have the capability of adjusting on the go while you're unloading if you want to. This video will take you all through all those steps that you need to get done. And there'll be a whole bunch of other series of videos on the consoles, what the switches do. So you can take a inexperienced operator, sit him in front there, he can go through every switches, and he'll come out of there being an expert combine operator. Some of the things that we offer for 2020. Uh, we come up with a new track suspension. Okay, we all know tracks on tractors or combines, they give you better flotations in a field. Okay, so that's why we put tracks on it. If you work in muddy conditions, you put tracks on, you can get into the field sooner and be able to harvest your crop without having to worry about getting stuck. So some of the features on the new, on the new tracks, as you can see on here, PowerFlex Tracks System. That's our trade name for them. Okay, so it has a suspension on it to where if I go over rough terrain, the track will actually automatically smooth out the bumps and humps and rocks and whatever else that's in the field. Okay, so your ride is gonna be a lot nicer using this type of track system. We still offer our standard track system that you've been ordering before, but now with this option, you get suspensions on it, which is kinda nice. The track itself is a new design track. It's a heavier track, 
So therefore it allows you to go up to 25 miles an hour with the, there's two different options. One will get you to 20 miles per hour, it'll have more torque. The second option will get you up to 25 miles per hour with a little less torque, but it's still quite usable in the field. So for a guy who does a lot of traveling, he may want to pick the option where I can drive 25 miles an hour and I can pull the header behind the combine without any issues. Shipping, this will be ordered through parts. Okay, shipping will start after July 20th. So we got them available for our combines and you can also put them on some competitive combines. So there's more to come to that for that feature. Some of the kits that I talk about, and I should rephrase that, I shouldn't call it a kit, there's some components that you can actually put on the older series combines, like a 8010 for example, or a 20 series, or a 30 series. These are things that we added to get better performance out of the spreading system at the back end of the combine. And so as you can see on here, this piece of rubber back here, I don't have the part number on my screen over here, but there is, if you go through to the parts counter and you ask for a curtain that fits between the Sivloss sensor pad and the tailboard, the chaff pan, then they'll go through the parts catalog and they can figure out what the part number is. What this rubber flap does over here is basically assures that the chaff and maybe some kernels, because we all know that combines, to get zero loss behind a combine, uh, sometimes it's not very effective, okay? So you'll be driving way too slow. Combines are made to save grain, yes, but there's a certain percentage of grain that is totally acceptable behind a combine. But you gotta make a good job of spreading it evenly across the 30 foot, 35 foot, 40 foot, 45 foot header, whatever you've got on the combine. So what these will do is they will assure that whatever comes off the sieve gets onto this chaff pan, which then gets delivered to your spreaders. And then the spreaders can spread it to whatever width header that you have on the front end of your combine. There's also another rubber flaps on here, which is the same rubber flap you see over here, so one that's right here on both sides of the combine. And those help to redirect material that's coming from the, the chopper itself. It'll come out towards the back end of the combine, it'll hit the sidewall, and then it'll divert it towards the center of the combine so that the spreaders can grab that material and spread it, okay? And the same thing with these dividers that are on this pan over here. If your combine does not have those dividers on there, you can buy them from parts, stick them on there, and then the residue system will work much more efficiently. So that's what these curtains do. So these curtains will fit on an 8010, they'll fit on a 20 series combine, they fit on a 30 series combines, they uh, did the 240 series combines, they were already installed on there from the factory. Okay, so if you look at your 240 series, the 80, 8240, 9240, you'll see that these are already installed on there. Okay, so those you don't have to worry about. Another one, this one I got smart and I put the part number in there, okay? So, for lack of a better word, I, I call it a chopper knife retarder bar. And what this little option will do for you is if you happen to put some non-compressible object through your combine and they happen to go through a chopper, you have stationary knives located underneath the chopper grate. And as those knives get dislodged from rocks or whatever else, then it takes a knife and it shoots it straight down and if you have the same luck as I have it goes right through your sieve and now you got to buy a new sieve. So what this bar does is actually bolts underneath the chopper grate and then when the knife lets go he comes down he hits this rubber pad and then it deflects the knife so it doesn't go through your sieve and cut your sieves apart. Okay so that's what it's used for. Now if you do put this kit on just remember that if I go and I put the stationary knives all the way down to drop straw and I go to raise them back up, the stationary knives might get caught underneath the rubber part over here. That's why there's quick snaps on here, just over center latch, you just pick them up, 
take the rubber piece off, move your knives up, stick it back on. Okay? But the beauty of this kit, it will save you some money. Because a sieve, as you know, is not, when you go, you can spend a thousand bucks real fast on a sieve. So. Another kit that we came out, we had a lot of discussion, complaints sometimes about customers saying, a knife came off the chopper and it went right through the, the uh, straw hood and it, it hit the oil pan. And I'm worried that maybe one day a knife will go through the oil pan. Okay, so it was designed like that to begin with. But then later on we decided that, okay, we didn't have to design it like that. So we added three pieces on here. This is the, the roof off the straw hood. So there's three plates goes on there and they're a quarter inch thick. So knives will not go through the uh, straw hood anymore. It, they'll get deflected straight down. So again, there's the kit number for it. Back in 2016, okay, we had some issues of wear on the feeder gearbox, on the shaft of the feeder gearbox, and also the top shaft. This is the top shaft here where the feeder chain actually runs over top of these sprockets over here. So we were getting wear in the splines and also wear on the gearbox. So we decided to drill a passage right through and the grease now can go straight down and go inside this cavity and actually lubricate the spline on the, rotor gear, on the uh, feeder gearbox shaft and also on to the top shaft splines. Okay? So that'll help reduce some of the wear that could be happening in there. Another thing we discovered is if you're going to go in there and do any work, make sure that you laser level the gearbox in there with the top feeder shaft and also the beater shaft. And then that way, that also reduces wear. Now, the new shaft, in order to identify which shaft you have in your combine, if you take the top cover off over here, this is the top of the feeder house. You take the cover off and you can see inside, you're going to see the top shaft. Here's where the grease nipple is located. Should be two, one on each side, one on top and one on the bottom side. There'll be a serial number stamped right into the shaft, right about here, somewhere in there. If you have a serial number stamped there, that means you already have the new shaft. If there's no serial number, it's the old style shaft. Okay? And while we're on this slide, we're also going to talk about, because you're looking inside here, you already got the cover off, inspect your uh, strippers over here. There's one of these for each one off the sprocket that's up top. Okay, so what you're looking for is you want to adjust this as tight to the sprocket as you can. We want one millimeter gap back in this area. All right, now, let's talk a little bit more. I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about optimizing the combine. So again, these adjustments that we're talking about here is when you get into critical operating condition or field conditions, sometimes we need to kind of set up the combine differently than when life is really good and everything is dry and you're ready to go, ready to go combine. So I always say, what is the first rule of harvesting? And I can guarantee you that Probably nobody in this group knows what that is. The crop has to be fit to harvest. How many times do you guys go to the field that the crop is fit to harvest? You simply watch the next door neighbor, and when the next door neighbor hits the field, that means your field is ready to go, okay? And not necessarily true. So we push the envelope all the time to try to get out there as quick as we can to shorten our harvest time. And a lot of times the crops is not quite ready yet. So some of the items to look for, first of all, when you get to the field, is go in there and look to see what your pre-harvest loss are. And then go harvesting and see how much header loss you've got. There might be leakage on the combine. And then after that, then it's basically understanding the combine. I could have some separator loss. I could have some cleaning loss. And that basically is accomplished by getting out of the seat for these two right here. You need to get out of the seat and go look behind the combine. Now we have a handy dandy tool, which I have here on the bench. 
Okay, so basically it's a square. Tells you how many kernels per square foot is allowed depending on the size of the header. So basically all you do is you just, as the combine is driving by, you've got two choices. Somebody else, you've got another operator. The second person can just throw this behind the combine anywhere on the ground and go in there and count how many kernels is inside this square foot. Or if you're by yourself, just take your square foot, you throw it on the ground, and then you get on your hands and knees and you count how many kernels is actually in here. Okay, and that'll give you how many bushels per acre I'm actually losing. So, and there's actually a grain loss calculator as well that you can use, which is quite handy. You can put it on your phone, and then you can put the number, the size of the head, the size of the field, and then input how many kernels you got on the ground, and it'll tell you how many bushels per acre you're actually losing. But just remember that a lot of this kernels that you find behind here, the number that I have in my screen down here, so that means that's square foot for every square foot that's actually in that field. All right. So if you've got that number of kernels, if you've got 10 kernels per square foot in that over there, I'm going to use wheat because that's a number I remember vividly in my brain. Okay, 21 kernels per square foot in the field on every square foot in that particular field will give me a bushel per acre loss. Okay, so it's easy to, to reference to. Other things to look for is sometimes the weather is not nice to you. So the weather can affect your crop, insect can, can affect it as well, disease, and again, we talked about that one, the timing of harvest. So I just threw a picture in there showing this is a head of wheat, okay, compared to that one. This one is a heck of a lot harder to thrash than this one. So then you may end up with unthrashed heads in the grain tank and you fight yourself trying to get them out. Sometimes you win, sometimes you don't, okay? so. You may not be able to adjust the combine to thrash this one out properly, but that's not the combine's fault. This was a disease in the crop. Another one that sometimes we forget about a lot is header loss. Okay, so if it can't make it from the header to the combine, there's no sense going any further. You have to adjust from the front of the combine towards the back. And I've always used, tried to brainwash myself that if I am adjusting your combine for too much loss behind the combine, you won't see me going out to the back of the combine. I'll go back to the back of the combine to see how much I have on the ground. But when I start adjusting my combine, I am going to start at the cutter bar or the corn head in this situation, and I'm going to analyze it to try to find out how much am I losing right here, because then I deduct that off of what I got behind the combine. And nine times out of 10, if you start adjusting your combine from the front versus the rear, you're gonna find your problem a lot faster. Okay, so always try to brainwash yourself. If I got lost behind the combine, it could be the header that's causing my loss. So I might as well start adjusting there. All right, header settings. Another one that's overlooked quite often is the reel. Now, comment down here, consistent and even crop feeding are the key elements to successful harvesting. So we got an expression we use at Case IH that's garbage in, garbage out. Okay, so anytime that you have a bad sample in the grain tank, it could very well be coming from the way you're feeding it. So again, start adjusting from the front. Could be the real pitch. These things are adjustable. Not too many people out there adjust their real, their real timing because it's not adjustable from the cab. You've got to get out, you've got to get some tools. And sorry, but some of us don't like that ladder climbing up and down because it's, it's too much effort. So if the switch not in the cab, it doesn't get done. So get off the seat, get down, and adjust the features that you have on the header first and then tries the buttons in the cab. It'll be much more efficient. You have got to feed that feeder house properly in order for any combine, doesn't matter which color they're painted, for that combine to perform properly. Headers is a big factor. For example, pickup heads. Pickup heads pretty simple. You lay a swat down, you run out there, and you try to run at five miles an hour and pick it up. 
but there is adjustments on a pickup head. Okay, so on here, I mean, guess what's wrong with this picture? I don't have to guess very much, I just look at it. The crop is coming up, it's going above the auger. That is not proper feeding. Okay, so you're going to have to get in there and do some adjustments. So this could be the belts are turning too fast. It could be the auger is turning too fast. There's two speeds on the auger. Okay, so you can get in there, change the sprocket over on the left hand side to slow it down or speed it up. The height of the auger is adjustable. And then also the finger timing is another one that's real, I'm going to say critical because I want to stress on it because nobody adjusts the, time, the timing of the fingers. It's just supposed to be done from the factory. Okay, so at the factory we do set them to where they are fully retracted at this position right here. This is the back of the header here. So this position right here is fully retracted. Not here, not here, down here. Okay, so you're looking at about four o'clock position here. If you're looking from the, from the left hand side of the header, if I'm looking from the right hand side, then it's going to be about the eight o'clock position. That's your starting point. That's where we think they feed the best. Now, why don't we weld it there? Okay, we could weld it solid and then you never have to worry about it again. Well, the reason they're not welded, some other companies, there's no adjustments there. But on ours, everyone that's got an auger, whether it's a draper header, an auger header, or a pickup head, there is adjustment. Because you might hit some conditions in the field that it will be to your advantage to change the timing slightly to feed it better between the auger and the feeder chain. And that's why we make it adjustable. Sometimes though what happens is if you happen to hit some rocks, it'll hit on the finger and it might slip the timing. So it's important before you start the season, start at the ideal spot, which is that position right there. Okay, so here's the adjustments. It's real easy to do. You got four bolts. You just loosen them up, put a wrench on the end over here and rotate this coupler. You see the spline right here? And that will change the timing. Now the auger height, I talk about auger height as well. They do come from the factory in the locked position. So this block assembly right here is in the bottom position. So undo the two bolts, move the block up, and that'll give you an inch and a half of float of that auger, which in canola, it's nice to have when you got those big heavy swats. All right, moving on further into the combine. The next thing is the faceplate adjustments. This position from here over to the auger in some conditions are critical. Okay, so you need to have the auger as close to that feeder chain as possible. And that's being done by moving the faceplate. It's being done by moving the front drum position up or down. It's done by feeder chain adjustments as well. If the feeder chain's worn out it's, and it's too close, or you've changed, you took a link out of the feeder chain and now it's too far from the auger, it's going to impede the feeding. So you need to be conscious of those things. All right, adjusting the faceplate if you do not have, like for example, on a 250 series, we do offer the optional uh, faceplate that can be adjusted from the cab. That's really nice. But if you don't have it, then you still have the ability to adjust it, but you have to do it by using wrenches. So you can see on here, this happens to be a 240 series combine. Okay, so you have four bolts up here and three bolts on the bottom. It pivots right here in the middle. So what you're trying to do is, if I got a pickup head, for example, you want this as far forward as possible, and it pivots in the middle, so therefore the bottom goes closer to the feeder chain, and then you get a better infeed off your dripper belts to your feeder chain. If I have a dripper header, for example, all the way down, forward, tilted all the way forward, you're not going to be able to adjust the angle of your guard angle properly to be able to get the right angle. So you're going to have to take the feeder face plate and move it further back. So what we look at basically coming from the factory they are set in the mid position because we have no idea what header you're going to put on. Okay, so I get my combine. I know I'm going to start with a straight cut header. 
So I'm in the mid position, you're probably okay. But then as soon as I go to the pickup head, the best position is to loosen all the bolts and let it slide all the way to the end of the slot here. And then you'll be in the proper position for your pickup head. If you do have a corn head, corn head you need the snouts a little further up. So you're going to loosen the bolts and you're going to rock it back to this position over here. And that'll give you the right angle for your snout on your corn head. Drum position. Drum position, there is a bolt on the side of the feeder, one on each side. And we'll get a close up of that here in a minute. So that's how you move the drum up and down. While we're on this slide over here, you'll notice the mechanism for the adjustment to the feeder chain. This happens to be an 8010 photo, 8120. Okay, so there is no spring adjustments on here. It was fixed at that time. But we do sell a kit through parts that you can actually put a spring-loaded system on here just like the new combine. Okay, so there's an li internal linkage and that needs to be changed, but it is retrofittable. Position of the front drum. If you look in your operator's manual, by the way, the operator's manual, that's that book that's in that uh, box that's underneath the seat that some of you guys have never seen before. So if you go in there, you're going to see that in the operator's manual, find the page, and it will give you the settings, okay? Corn position and other large grain, edible beans, all the way to the up position. That's the position they come from the factory. Mid position, small grain, edible beans, depending on the requirements, okay? So it's up to the operator to decide where it needs to go. I know in small grain, it is a lot more effective because in small grain, you need traction on that crop. So if the drum can come all the way down to that position, then it will drag the material up into the feeder house a lot easier. And sometimes if it's all the way up, it can't quite grab it. You've got to force feed it. And that's not good when you're force feeding. Lower position, basically for grass seed, okay? because the swat is usually not as heavy coming into the combine. So you drop it down to the bottom position. And I might as well tell you now, if you put it in the lower position, when you're running empty at the end of the field, you may hear the feeder chain tapping on the floor. That's not unusual, okay? If you don't like it, raise it up. Just know, raise it up to the mid position, but just know that you're not at the ideal position. Okay, usually when there's crop in there, you don't hear any noise. It's only when there's no crops in. All right, front drum. There is a little window just below the bolt. Okay, it's just a little hole drilled into the side of the combine. And if that window is totally open to where I can see inside the feeder house, that means the drum is in the up position. If the window is partially blocked off, that means you're in mid. And if it's totally blocked off, you're all the way down with the front drum. And all you got to do is just loosen that nut over here, take a half inch wrench, put it on the end of the bolt, because the end of the bolt's got a flat spot on it, and you can rotate it with the wrench. And then relock your bolt back in place. Okay, moving on to feeder chain adjustments. You'll see on here the spring, there's a gauge located on the bottom. And the gauge basically needs to be flush with the inside of the, of the washer on this side over here. As long as it's flush with the inside of the washer, that's the right position. There's a spacer inside this spring, which has got the same length as the gauge. Okay, so when you tighten this bolt down, it's going to get to the spacer. And then after you, the spacer's bottomed out, the gauge will automatically flush with the inside of the washer. If I keep torquing down on this bolt, I'm not going to collapse this spring any further because there's a spacer inside. It's just going to pull the bolt right through the spacer and over tighten your chain. So I always recommend when you're tightening the chain, torque on here until you feel that it's turning a lot harder and then turn it back a turn and a half on the bolt and you're going to be doing pretty darn good. You'll be right in the ballpark of where you need to be. Now the connector links. Connect the links on the chain. There's a proper way and a wrong way to put it on. So if you happen to shorten your chain, 
make sure that you put the nut side of the connector link away from this ring that you see right here. There's a ring welded onto here, and put the nut on the opposite side. Whichever, where, wherever the ring is welded, you're going to put the nut away so that it doesn't rub onto that ring that's welded onto the drum. Now, when, you do, when you're working with used combines, it's going to get to the point eventually, the feeder chain's going to be wore out, so you're going to have to go in there and take some links out. And usually, when it gets to where it gets worn, the slats now become too close to this front, uh, this front plate right here. So you need to move the feeder slats away, so you take a connector link out, take a half link out, and that will increase this distance over here. And I always said, there's no magic uh, number to how far away I can be, but I can tell you right now that if you go more than about an inch and a half to an inch and three quarter from here to there, that's the, the uh, shield that's up front here, if you go too far back, the feeder chain cannot reach the material to pull it into the combine. So if you get to that point to where it's too far, this distance is too far back, sorry, but you're going to have to buy a new chain. Your chain is worn out. So. All right, that's part of the feeder. Now let's move on into the heart of the combine. This is basically the heart of the axle flow combine is what we refer to. Feeder chain brings the material up at about somewhere about five miles an hour. And then once it hits this area right here, if you're operating in wheat, the speed of the material needs to increase from about five miles an hour to about 60 miles an hour before it hits the rasp bars and your concave on the mid-range and the modules on the, on the flagship combine. So that's kind of critical in a way that this area, if it ends up getting too much wear in it, because there's veins inside there that wear, there's impellers that wear, so it is a wearing point. So you just got to keep on it every year, check it out, see if the wear is excessive. If it is excessive, you need to change the veins, you need to change the, the lugs on the, or the uh, wear strips on the front of the gradual pitch impeller. Now, the other thing that goes with this is, you see on here, that it also creates a vacuum, a sucking action of about 400 cubic feet of air from the front of the feeder chain. That air comes through from the header all the way into the feeder house, into this area, and then that air that's actually brought in gets distributed around the rotor and around the rotor cage, and that air also helps to push the grain outside of the rotor cage, and it helps with separation. Two things that it does. One, it helps with separation in the threshing area, and the second thing it does, which is most important, is you will see very little dust in front of your combine because it sucks all that dust inside the combine. And that all comes from this area right here. All right, threshing principle once you get inside here. And this is basically any combine. I don't care what color they're painted. Once you get inside the threshing area, every rotary combine has the same particular uh, things that needs to happen inside there. 90% or 100% of the threshing and 90% of the separation needs to happen in what we refer to as the threshing area. The f on the flagship combines, number one modules, number two modules, number three modules, number four modules. Number one and two is threshing area, number three and four is separating area. Okay, so 100% of threshing happens here and 90% of separation. This part back here basically does 10% of the separation. So that's why sometimes we're not big on putting blank off plates onto the threshing area because if you put blank off plates, that number automatically goes down. So if it goes down to 80% instead of 90%, that means this guy over here has got to do 20% of the separation. It is not designed to do that. Okay, so then you might end up losing past the rotor onto the ground. So again, be conscious that if I'm going to use blank off plates in the threshing area, that I'm encouraging rotor loss. So, 
That's the part you got to watch. Multiple passes inside. And this is, these multiple passes are controlled by the cage veins. If I've got them on the 240 series and prior combines, all the way to 1977, there's three positions. Slow, medium, and fast. When we went to the 250 series, we enlarged the window. Okay, so we have, if you've got manual adjust, you've got very slow, slow, medium, and fast. But on all 240 series and prior, all the way to 1977, it's slow, medium, fast. Now in the mid position, you get five passes. In the slow position, you get seven passes. And in the fast position, you get three passes. Okay? So depending on the crop that you're in, you adjust the vein to get the best thrashion and the best separation. This is showing the simulating the rotor cage cover. That's the cage itself. That's what the veins is bolted to. So this is all in the mid position. But if I need a little bit more thrashing, I'm going to take the veins in the thrashing area and stand them up a little further. And that'll slow the crop down so I get more passes on the concave. And then the other one stays in the mid. If I have too much rotor loss, then I can adjust the ones in the rear portion and slow them down to keep the stuff in the combine a little more. But just remember, the more you keep the stuff inside the combine, the more it breaks it up, then it puts more debris onto your cleaning system. More material other than grain on there. If I'm into an easy thrashing crop, I can put them in a fast position, get them out of there as quick as possible. I'm trying to bale straw, for example, behind a combine. Might not be a bad idea to put them in a fast position. They won't damage the straw quite as much. So if I'm in canola, maybe I want them in a fast position. Because canola, if it's ideal thrashing condition, it breaks up pretty good. And then you overload the cleaning system with material other than green. All right, here's a close-up of what they look like inside the combine. You can see the ones in the separating area right here. And there is some also in the threshing area all the way to the front. Now you can see the position here. Right now it's in the mid position. You slide them forward. You put them in this position right here. That'll be fast. You move them to this slot right here. That'll be slow position. So three position. All right. Looking at the window. The window usually is a good visual. So you look at the window. You can see the sample in the green tank. That's why we put a big window in there. So we want you to be able to just take a quick look, look at the window, see how clean it is, and then adjust your combine accordingly. Now, this happens to be wheat, and you see some white caps here in between the green. And I always like to talk about this in clinics because there's some operators that if they don't see 100% grain on here, they panic. Okay, so there's no need to panic. Relax, because the combine is designed to have the dirtiest spot of the grain tank right against the window. So my measuring gauge is, if I see white caps on here and I see grain in between the white caps, I'm jumping into my red pickup truck and I'm leaving the farm. Okay, because the sample is good. You need to go and look inside the grain tank to see how good it is. Or better yet, go and look in the grain cart or in the semi. And then you're going to see that your sample all of a sudden improves a whole bunch. Okay, so don't be too, too concerned about getting 100% of the white caps out because if you do that, you're probably going to end up with cracks, which cracks is worse than a few white caps. Okay, so be cautious when you're looking at the window. It's not the end of the world. All right, let's use a scenario that we have way too many. Okay, we do have tools that you can put in there to help yourself because there are certain crops that you get into that white cap becomes a big issue and you have to beat them out of there. So as far as modules, we sell in modules, what we call a hard thrash modules. The bars are actually tighter together than a small grain concave or modules. Okay, so, but if you buy a kit, there's a big plate that comes on the bottom 
that covers the whole complete modules. So you're going to say, wow, Louis just talked to me a little while ago and says, the blank, if I put blank off plates on the concave, I reduce the separating area. That is correct. This plate for white caps, I do not recommend to put this plate on there. OK, so put the module in, but forget the plate, because it takes way too much horsepower, and you're going to end up with way too many cracks. And also, a, with working in the field and playing around, adjusting this, and trial and error, uh, I find that I get the most out of my hard thresh kit if I put this module in the front on the left hand side. So that would be my, my uh, first modules. I would put a hard thrash on this on the left hand side of the combine. That's always sitting in the seat, by the way. Okay, left is left, right is right. Number one position, I put my hard thrash module. On the opposite side, right hand side, I would put my In the kit also comes a plate that goes right above here and covers the hole in the rotor cage. Because right here behind this shaft over here, there is holes just like these ones or these ones. So you put a plate on there and you cover those holes on the left hand side and the right hand side. Okay? And that will keep those white caps inside the rotor housing and they get a second chance of being caught on the opposite side when they come back down. So that'll help to rethrash the uh, white caps. A lot of the times, 90% of the time, all you need is the plates on. You don't even need to use the hard thrash module. Okay, so you can buy through parts separately, just the rotor cage plates, or you can buy the whole complete kit, which includes rotor cage plates and the module. So it's your choice. I recommend put the plates only, and 99 times out of 10, it's, it's good enough. All right, moving on to the separating area. Separating area on a flagship combine is a self-leveling cleaning system. Front end over here, you have your grain pan. Then you have your pre-sieve. Top sieve, bottom sieve. If you have a mid-range combine, you're going to end up with augers on here instead of a flat grain pan. It's okay. This purpose over here is to move the grain from here over to the cleaning system. Take it away from underneath the rotor cage and move it towards the back of the combine. On the bigger combines, we elected to put the grain pan because you need to start the separating process right off the bat. So basically the grain pan is oscillating up and backwards and it takes the kernels, the clean kernels, it helps to move them onto the metal portion and it moves the material other than grain above the grain. So then as soon as the grain comes to dribble off onto the pre-sieve, most of the clean grain is already on the bottom and the chaff is on top. So it helps to separate that stuff a lot easier. Now sieve calibration. Well, I'll refer you to sieve calibration. There is, in the monitor, in the Pro 700, there is a procedure for adjusting the sieve calibration. And we're going to have a section on adjusting uh, sieve calibration. But for now, things I want to point out for you when you first look at your combine is make sure that, especially on the pre-sieve, pre-sieve is the adjuster is right here. Pre-sieve is up front. That's this part right here. Okay, here's the pre-sieve. Linkage goes all the way to the back here. So, I like to go and calibrate this thing. And once you've done it, one time, then you pretty well know where it is. Okay, so, because when they come from the factory, this thing is slotted over here, and I could be in this position over here, and the sieve is completely closed. Okay, so, we do offer through the, uh, part system, there's a little gauge assembly that you can actually use as a measuring tool. I usually, usually use a Allen wrench or a piece of key stock, anything that you've got that's got a good measurement. So what I normally do is I just set the gauge on here to where I have one eighth of an inch on the pre-sieve, and then I adjust the quadrant and the linkage back here 
so that this notch over here comes right here. So I lock, the handle gets locked in the first notch. So I know now that that will be, the sieve will be adjusted at one eighth of an inch. There's no crops that we go into that you need to fully close the pre-sieve that I'm aware of, okay? All the crops that we do that I've been exposed to, small grain, canola, grass seed, always one eighth of an inch, okay? And then after that, my rule of thumb is, then you don't have to adjust the quadrant any more than whatever the size of the kernel is. So if I go to peas, for example, I'm going to take the P and I'm going to use the P as my gauge. Instead of using my fancy little gauge, I'll use the P and I will move the quadrant so that the P can slide in. The P can slide in there, she's good. Okay? Soybean would be the same thing. I use the soybean. I don't fight myself. I use whatever the crop that I'm harvesting. I take the size of it and I just try to put it in there. If it fits, life is good. The only place where the rule doesn't apply is when you get into canola and grass seed because I like to keep it within that three millimeter to one eighth of an inch. So. All right, uh, this section over here, what we're going to look at is a little simulator that we use uh, in order to try and explain to customers what actually happens inside the combine. Uh, if you, can, you can see the bar graphs located up at the top end and there's one for rotor loss, there's one for uh, sieve loss, one for returns, uh, one's for grain tank sample, and then the most important one is the one for engine load. As you can see on here, it's running at 90% engine load, and you can see the bar graph up top, it's all gone to that one line, everything is green, that means that the combine is absolutely working flawlessly right now. So which is something that quite, ha quite often happens to customers in the field. You're operating, your combine's doing a really nice job, and then all of a sudden you see the clouds coming, and then you decide that, oh, uh, I need to drive faster. So all of a sudden, you push on the lever a little more, and as soon as you push on the lever, then you increase your ground speed, and you'll see on here, the minute that I increase my ground speed, you'll notice that up at the top end, if I look at my bar graph, it went from 90% engine load to 120% engine load. And you'll notice the rest of the bar graph, the sample went dirtier, the rotor loss increased, the sieve loss increased, the cracks and broken increased, everything went downhill. Okay, so the reason why that happens is because in order to go from 90% engine load to 120% engine load, the engine actually grew in horsepower to go from 90 to 120. So you got lots of power. So you see the clouds coming, lots of power. So I can drive this fast. But in order to go from 90% engine load to 120%, the engine normally at rated speed is 2100 RPM at 100% of engine load. Once I push it to 120% of engine load, the engine RPM needs to come down in order to grow horsepower. So as soon as it gets down to about 1900 RPM, now you're at 120% engine load, and there's another thing that's happening at the same time. Rotor speed, I can go and re increase it again, not a problem. I can increase my fan speed, I can adjust my sieve to try to compensate for it and clean my sample in the tank, but the one factor that you cannot, you have no control over is the speed of the oscillating of the cleaning system. When it went from 2100 RPM down to 1900, the speed of the cleaning system is not running as fast. And that's what degrades the quality of grain tank and rotor loss and sieve loss. Okay, so can I run at 120% engine load to go through that one spot in the field? Absolutely. Okay, that's what it's there for. But in your own mind, you should be concentrating on the fact that maybe I'm losing a little bit more when I'm going through this spot, okay, which is totally normal, but you need to get there in order to push that crop through the combine, okay? So, but to run there at 110 and 115 percent engine load all day long, you might as well be prepared to have more loss behind the combine and maybe a little harder to clean the sample. 
So on most of the time, I tell customers, you know, run it at 90% engine load and you're totally comfortable. You can go to 100, but just remember, as soon as I creep up over to 100, cleaning system's not running as fast and it starts to degrade a little bit. So it may not be excessive loss, but like I said before, the more money, the more grain you put in the grain tank, the more money you put in the bank. So just remember that. So that's how a combine actually operates in the field. Uh, over here, the one thing is clear to be able to point this out. Uh, when you're checking your combines, if you find that for some reason the sample, I can't clean it, I got too much loss, whatever it is, one of the easy things to look at is stick your head in the back end of the combine and have a look and make sure that your left sieve, this sieve right here, because they're in two, one here on the left, one here on the right. So measure the gap on this sieve and make sure that it is the same distance as this one over here. Because if rocks got in there or mice, dead mice, whatever, sometimes the linkage will slip a little bit and your left sieve will be more open than the right hand sieve. And if it gets like that, you are done. You will never fix the throwing over problem or the dirty sample in the grain tank. Because what happens is a little 10 millimeter bolt located right here and it's slotted. So what can happen if there's some debris caught inside, sometimes it'll slip. And when it slips, it gets the two sieves out of adjustment. So you just need 10 millimeter, loosen the bolt over here, there's another one back on the other linkage just like this, and then take the handle, adjust both sieves so that they are equal, and retighten your 10 millimeter bolts, and you're back in business. All right, now moving on to the next portion of it. Kill stall. Kill stall is being used when you have exhausted everything. You've tried every adjustment on the combine and you can't figure out what is going on. Why can't I stop this throwing over? Or why can't I cannot clean the sample in the grain tank? The kill stall is kind of like a road map. Okay, so if you're totally lost and you've done everything, you do a kill stall. I always make a joke about this all the time because customers will tell me, Louis, I've tried every adjustments in the book. And I always go back to them and I says, why are you phoning me then? Because if you've tried everything, I don't have any more than what you got. Okay, there's no magic. All the adjustments are all in the operator's manual. So you missed something somewhere. Okay, so here comes the kill stall. By the way, the steps to do a kill stall is also in the operator's manual. All right, so find the section and follow the step by step, just like you see on here. Okay, lock the brake pedals together, go and harvest at your normal operating speed, and then you put one hand on the hydro handle, the other hand on the throttle, and it's a simultaneous motion. Okay, so hand on the throttle, Hand on the hydro handle, you pull the throttle back, you push the hydro handle all the way forward, squeeze on the brakes until the engine dies. Now you don't have to do this in one second. Okay, like I said, it's, it's a gradual motion and then you'll get a nice kill stall slowly, life is good. And then everything will fall dead in its track, right where it needs to be, and then gives you an opportunity to go and analyze. Okay, now once you've done that, Restart the engine, let it cool down a little bit, and then after that, shut it off. Okay, shut it off. That is the main important part. Just remember, you're going to be crawling inside that combine. If you're crawling inside the combine, you do not want the engine running. And it's probably not a bad idea to have the key in your pocket as well, so that nobody else can go and accidentally start it when you're inside. Okay, so safety first, and then after that, you go analyze. All right, so this was basically operating in, uh, I've done it in two places, one in Arizona, one in Oklahoma. And when we did the kill stall, we go in there and we start analyzing. And if the whole system is operating properly, my sample is clean, I have no loss, life is really good, and I do a kill stall, what you're gonna see is, you're gonna see a pile of stuff material onto the grain pan, this is the pre-sieve over here, so it's all covered up. 
This is the top sieve right here. If the top sieve is completely open, about 15 inches, somewhere in there, and then the rest of it is covered up all the way to the back end of the combine, I can almost bet you dollars to donuts that you do not have any throwing over and you have a clean sample in the grain tank. It's almost guaranteed, okay? It's when it doesn't look like this that it's not good, okay? So now let's go back and we're gonna do another kill stall after we readjust the combine and go through the same motion. We did another kill stall, we looked at it. All of a sudden you look inside here and you can see that, whoa, my 15 inches that I had over here, which was totally open before, now it's open way too much. So now you have to scratch your head and say, whoa, what just happened here? What could be the possible causes over here? Well, I've been operating combines for 40 years plus, and the one thing that I have learned in those 40 years is the fact that any time that the sample is not clean enough in the grain tank, everybody that sits on that driver's seat will go to fan speed right off the bat. Fan speed is always the magic thing that fixes every ailment that we had got in a combine. It's not true, okay? So I get the comments all the time, you know, Louis, how come you only give me 1,100 RPM on the fan? I, I need 4,000 RPM. I could give you 10,000 RPM, you'd never fix it, okay? So, so this could be, it's too clean on here. So it could be a possibility of too, wide, too, too high a fan speed. It could be the possibility of a upper sieve open too much, bottom sieve open too much, because it's allowing all the air to go to the top and it's over cleaning it. But in the meantime, it's throwing grain out the back end and it's giving you a dirty sample, okay? So in this situation over here, we had 15, 20 guys we were all analyzing. So we said, okay, which, which one is it? Which adjustment we do first? Well, from past experience, I know that most operator always run fan speed way too high. So I said, why don't we pick on fan speed? So we took the fan speed, we lowered the RPMs down. Because the reason why I picked fan speed, because I wanted to get more material on the cleaning system. That was my idea behind it. I don't have enough right now. So I'm gonna use my fan speed, I'm gonna lower it down and see what happens. So we lowered the fan speed down by 50 RPM. We went, did another kill stall. And this is what we found, okay? So you can see on here that this trough over here is full all the way to the front. And these ones are open on the sides over here. So that was lowering the fan RPM. Now, if I increase my fan RPM, what am I gonna get? There you go. Well, obviously that's not the right adjustment. So, now if I open up the top sieve wider, is this gonna fall through there? Yeah, probably a pretty good chance. But don't forget, the picture down below on the bottom sieve looks just like this. So if I allowed this material to fall on the bottom sieve, what do you think this bottom sieve looks like right now? It's going to be worse. Once it goes through the bottom sieve, where does it go? Up in the green tank. So that's why you see a whole bunch of chaff and debris in the green tank. So in other words, any adjustments that I do with the cleaning system right here, Top sieve, bottom sieve, fan speed will never, never fix this issue. This has nothing to do with the cleaning system whatsoever. Okay? So now, where is it? Remember when I said when we started, always start adjusting from the header and move back? Now this is where you're starting. If you're bunching up on the header and it goes inside the feeder house, and it's a more aggressive thrashing at one spot than another spot, you're gonna to dump too much grain onto the grain pan right in this area. Right now, what's holding this chaff down is there's way too much grain here for over here. So I need to take the grain off that grain pan and move it over here or over there somewhere to where I can equalize the amount of grain all the way across that pre-sieve. Once I get that accomplished, don't matter where I got the cleaning system set at, okay? Cleaning systems are very, very forgiving. And if you run out of fan speed, that brings you back to possibly it is a thrashing problem. 
Maybe I should fix the thrashing problem first, and then I'll have enough fan speed. Okay? So, over here, we all agreed that, no, nope, we're not going to clean this with the cleaning system, so let's do something else. So, what we did is we went and we reduced the rotor RPM. And we went and did another kill stall. Well, reducing the rotor RPM moved the pile from here to here. So it's still not fixed yet. It's getting a little more open at the front, but this one's wide open all the way to the back end of the combine. So you're still going to end up with throwing over too much. So we knew that now lowering the rotor speed, that it moved the pile over to the right hand side of the combine. So one guy says, geez, let me jack the rotor speed all the way up, see what happens. So we cranked the rotor speed all the way up, went and did another kill stall, and guess what? Now it shoves everything over to this side, and there's hardly anything on this side. So just moving the rotor speed up and down will move where the grain is falling onto this grain pan. Okay, you slow it down, it's going to move the pile over to the right, you speed it up, it moves it over to the left. Now, we have to scratch our head a little bit and say, why does it do that? Well, the reason why it does that, on the flagship combine, the pinch point is bottom dead center right here. Okay, so if the pinch point is there, from the modules to the RAS bar, and if I had a flagship or mid-range combine from the concave to the RAS bar, that's this wide, I can only allow so much stuff to go in between. So as I'm coming from the right hand side, I'm coming down, I can't make it past the pinch point, I'm going to dump here. So if I slow the rotor speed down, I can't drive it through the pinch point, so it falls here. As soon as I speed up the rotor, I can drive more stuff past the pinch point over to this side. And then it increases the load on the other side. So rotor speed will affect what happens on that grain pan. Now, you've got to ask yourself the question next. What happens if I make that pinch point wider? I leave the rotor speed at the same spot, but I open up the pinch point. So now it's going to be easier to drive material past the pinch point to this side. And if I close it tighter, then it's going to force the stuff to fall over here. So by moving the concaves or modules up tighter, it's going to dump to the right hand side, opening it up, it's going to dump more to the left hand side. So now, you have to figure it out. It's all the operator, it's got nothing to do with Louis or anything like that. Okay, You're the one that has to decide which adjustment am I going to take. Okay, Sometimes I drive a little fast going down the road. I like speed. I like speed because speed is directly related to the speed of my ground speed. So if I speed up my rotor and I can fix the problem, that means that I might be able to just drive a little faster in the field and get the same thing accomplished. So for me, I always pick rotor speed. If that doesn't work, pick the adjustments of the modules or concave. Okay? Now, when you adjust, remember, it's not 200 RPM. Increments increase. All right, and after you do adjustment, don't panic when you look in the grain tank and you haven't cleaned the sample yet. We had a dirty sample before. I haven't cleaned it yet. Make sure that you drive far enough in the field. You got to remember the crop has got to come from all the way up here, front of the combine, all the way to the back end of the combine. That takes X number of seconds to happen. So your changes, when you do changes, is not going to be instantly. Just let the combine fill itself and then see if you improved it. And if you did, good. If you didn't, try another adjustment. A lot of times what I do is I just use the, my sieve loss indicator. If I got a cleaning system problem, dirty sample in the grain tank, I will use nine times out of ten, the sieves will be indicating that you have loss behind the combine. So, you can watch it, and if you see it increasing, you've gone the wrong way. If you see it decreasing, uh-oh, it's helping, it's helping, then you're going to see it come back up. At that point, quit playing rotor speed, play with your concaves or module position. And keep adjusting, one at a time, okay? Do not just do two or three, because you're smarter than everybody else. One adjustment at a time, 
that's the keyword combine. And then you keep tweaking until finally this thing carries on. And guess what? You end up back to where you need it to be. Your sample is cleaned up in the grain tank. Your loss is cleaned up at the back end of the combine. So that's why you use a kill stall. So it's a good road map to tell you immediately what's going on. So the more grain that you can save, back to our old saying, more grain in the tank equals more money in the bank. Make sure that you have a safe 2020 harvest. All right? So good luck out there. Thanks for watching.